start with a, a really broad question, which is like, if I were a designer right now, I would feel just crazy with the number of platforms, the number, the proliferation of screens. There's so many different things now to design for. And I'm wondering how you guys feel in that space and sort of where, how do you design for all these platforms? What are you thinking, are you thinking about VR? Are you thinking about the design for the, the, the you know, when our, our car windshields become screens? Like, um, how do you kind of like hone it down into uh, little blocks that you can handle? Okay, uh, I'll give it a go. Um, so I've been, I guess, uh, in the industry for about three years very short amount of time. Um, when I graduated, I actually worked in a, a print studio, a graphic studio, Atelier David Smith in Dublin, in Science Gallery, and now I'm in IBM. So um, even in a short space of time, I've kind of touched on various kind of um, domains of design. So I totally understand where you're coming from. And even now, working at IBM, there are also a million options as a designer, so you can work as a product designer, service designer, and various others. Uh, so it is kind of daunting, I think, especially for young designers, but I think it's incredibly exciting as well. Um, so I think, you know, starting off at, at one point and then growing and figuring it out as you go is, it, it might be challenging, but I think it's really exciting. Um, I don't know if I have like an answer for you in terms of you know how to whittle it down into something that's really kind of um, digestible, but um, I think it's it's an exciting time and design is so accessible and yeah. it's you know it's, it's a huge topic. Like we're here today to talk about design and major corporations and the things that Fjord are doing and IBM are doing um, you know on a global scale and tapping into business and technology. It just opens up the doors for designers, particularly yeah. younger designers, so I think that's pretty great. I, I think the um, <clears throat> designers sometimes get preoccupied with technology and designing for platforms instead of going back and saying, what are we trying to do? And I remember, <clears throat> you know, just thinking about the Mayo Clinic, I was at the Cleveland Clinic um, in Cleveland, which has a concept of patient first, and the designers uh, participated in a, in a program where everybody in the company got in a room at various times and they, they went over every touch point that a customer uh, or patient has and they determined that 100, anybody that came into that hospital they interacted with 100 people. Mm -hmm. And the designers were given the task of trying to make that a informative um, experience and that at every point what this hospital concept of patient first came first. So I was walking along the corridor and there was an 18-foot um, avatar uh, and a screen sign that came up and talked to me and said, where are you going? Can I help you? What are you doing? And gave me a printout of where That's I was cool. going. Um, when people were waiting for somebody who was having an operation, they had a code number and there was a chart up on the wall and it showed exactly where the status uh, of the thing is. So, I mean, the, 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 it, I think designers should work more toward what, what are they trying, who are you trying to communicate with, what kind of supportive behavior, behavior do you want, and not get preoccupied with technology. We're talking today about human-centered design. So well, obviously that's sort of like standing in, in contrast then to what would be not human-centered design. That would be kind of engineer-centered or data-driven. Like how, how do those forces work together? The, the, the way that that potentially to frame it is that data is just another material. Like design is trained, like I trained yeah. to use fabric, right? I, I learned to understand it, I learned how to manipulate it, I learned how to make it into a like, form and to actually build it. And so I think, you know, people work in wood and then work in metal and they work in, you know, we, and I think just to kind of, I think about it as a raw material and to start to go cool. back to the principles of design and say, it's a material that, that can craft, you know, you can actually create things out of. Those things may not be physical, but you're still creating things that people can interact with and value and use, or like these tools and these spaces and stuff. And so I think it really is thinking about it, like allowing yourself to think about it in a traditional way. I think there's also, a <clears throat> if you like, a market reason why uh, we will continue to put humans at the center of design. And, and frankly, if we, you know, when we stop doing that, I don't want to do it anymore personally. But I, I think the market reason is that there's a lot of alarming uniformity in the market in terms of the way things look. I think it's an unintended consequence of the stranglehold, particularly in mobile, that Android and iOS has over things. I find it very frustrating. 
And I think that with, with the sort of breakout we're getting now, driven by the Internet of Things and many, many more devices coming to market and many more environments where we're going to be experiencing things, I think there's a fantastic opportunity um, for designers to create new and, and beautiful and different ways of interacting with things which can break out of this sort of, I think, mental stranglehold that um, web browsers, I mean, you know, so many websites look the same these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can describe them, I can draw for you now what they look like. Yeah. And, and I think the market push on this is differentiation. So there are and will be organizations out there that want to make themselves look different. They want their interaction to be different. In, and that's why design has moved to the center because everyone understands that experience is a key way to differentiate an organization and its products and services. You did a design project around um, eating insects and, and sort of around, <laughs> around uh, making people feel comfortable <laughs> with eating insects. Yep. Um, and which is like such a perfect example of using design to help people feel comfortable with something new and something innovative, which is what everyone who's working in design is sort of doing. For me, um, I was kind of curious about food, a uh, bit of a foodie, and uh, design using communications and design to engage people. And then also I was really interested in the idea of sustainability. And uh, I kind of put those three things together, did a bit of research, and this was in 2013. Um, so there was a report published um, by the FAO and you know, saying that insects as food uh, is a viable solution for the future because of you know, land depletion, climate change. We heard Robin Chase this morning talking about you know, climate change. It, it's happening, it's inevitable. How do we stop this or at least contribute to it? Um, and you know, this growing population by 2050, we'll have nine billion people or more living on the planet, so how do we feed these people? So all of these things cropped up in my research um, along with edible insects, and I thought, oh, I don't think I could do that. <sighs> um, so I kind of took it as a bit of a challenge. It was a speculative project. I developed this, um, I guess, an educational platform, so it's just a website, but uh, it educates people people around entomophagy, which is the practice of eating insects, then built this kind of speculative brand um, around, you know, thinking about, well, if you walked into your supermarket, uh, uh, could you pick up insects off the shelf, and what would it look like? How would people react to that? Um, did a series of tests uh, with people eating bugs for the first time, and... It's um, so cool. I kind of, like, that was back in 2013, but I've, I've kept going at it, um, and I think... I've really realized the value of, again, understanding people's needs on the other end. Well, you've done a lot with uh, virtual reality and, and with virtual reality design. And, 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 and that kind of is an interesting, I, I go back and forth on whether that's a big sort of bubble fad that's happening or whether that's absolutely the future and where the next billion dollars are going to be made. But do you think it's a similar kind of trend? It's not social friendly at the moment. I think that's right. It's not social. It's not socially friendly at the moment. Yeah, no. It's exclusive. And, and I think that's a problem. However, I think the quality of the experiences we're now seeing, I mean, the thing that blew me away was trying painting. Um, and when you paint for the first time in four dimensions, it is quite breathtaking. Um, and you begin to wonder pretty quickly, what would, what would Picasso have done with this? You know, when you can, you start actually by drawing, I don't know how many people have tried it, but you start by doing 2D, because that's what your, you, mm -hmm. your brain knows. And then tentatively, you pull the paintbrush towards you. And there's this line in the air. And you can go and look underneath the line. And you can walk around and look at the, and I mean. It, oh, it's it, so cool. So I, I cannot, I find it impossible to believe that the sort of things that that is going to open up aren't going to be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. I, I think the bigger thing to think so about cool. as a guidance system is not so much when will this become acceptable. I don't know whether it will. But what we're in the process of doing is mapping another dimension onto the planet. <laughs> Want to be in the audience next time? Click here for tickets to InspireFest 2017.